Robert De Niro also believes the ending is literal and was pushing for many years for a sequel, saying, I'd like to see where Travis is today. There was something about the guy, all that rage and alienation, that's what the city can do to you. Paul Schrader had said, De Niro suggested a sequel to Marty and I about 15 years ago, and I told him it was the dumbest idea that I'd ever heard. Today, well wait, hold on, hold on, this is my first time doing a podcast. Welcome to the Perfect <laughs> Movie Podcast, the podcast where you answer the question, is this Perfect Movie? I'm Michael. I'm Kalen. And today, we are doing our series of May movies called Marty May. Now you might be asking yourself, what Marty are you talking about? Nope. Marty McFly? Could have been Marty McFly, but nope. Not Martin Freeman, the star of The Hobbit and the Sherlock series, and he's a CIA agent in some of the Marvel movies. Nope, not Martin Lawrence. You saw Bad Boys? <laughs> Did you see uh, his one line in Do the Right Thing where he goes, you might as well throw them shit away. Them shit is broke. <laughs> not Martin, Martin Luther King Jr., although respect, respect. He had a dream. Not the topic. Not Martin Luther and all his theses on the door. Oh, yeah. Not Martin Shkreli, the man who bought that like cancer medicine and then upped the price and then went to prison for price gouging. Oh my God. <laughs> There's a lot of Martins in the world. So you might be confused, but the Martin we're talking about this month is Martin Scorsese. The man that some people say is the greatest living filmmaker. I would be inclined to agree with that. It's one of my personal faves, well, that's for sure. He's had a lot of life to run the... Absolutely. Lay down the track. And what we're doing for Marty May is we've kind of selected a film from each decade of Martin Scorsese's career, which starts in the 70s, up and through the 2010s. Actually, it starts in the 60s, but I think his first feature film, or it wasn't actually a feature film, but it was like more of a short film, but that kind of led down the path of him uh, dropping some bangers. So I stand corrected, but his first, like, since his breakout movies, which his first breakout was, it was mean, either Mean, mean Streets, Streets, yeah, um, and then they have Taxi Driver which is the topic of today's podcast. Before watching it for this uh, podcast, I had not seen Taxi Driver. It was a hole in my Marty uh, vocabulary. Um, we kind of collaborated on how to make this list. Yeah. Taxi Driver is definitely a standout. I think it's the first of his movies that really breaks through and people are like, this is art. This is the yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Kalen, what do you think about Taxi Driver? Um, so this is probably my third viewing of Taxi Driver. I think the first time I saw this was years back. Um, and I think it always kind of stood out to me just by the imagery. Um, it's very stylized. Um, it, it's very different from our typical Martin Scorsese that we know today. Um, but it still has some of that groundwork that's kind of like... Uh, laid into this film that you can see over time. I think the biggest thing would probably be like the dialogue. Mm -hmm. uh, Martin Scorsese is really good at doing natural dialogue and stuff that feels like real conversations between characters. Um, like there's characters that stutter. Uh, it almost feels like there's no script. It's kind of just two actors just kind of talking to each other. And I really appreciate that. And I love that about his films. Um, but yeah, this is a very different type of movie as opposed to like a Goodfellas or something along those types of lines. Um, it's very, I would say it's got like this, this very dark and kind of almost depressing tone to it. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it, it's still like you were saying, it's like, it's art. It's got some artistic flavor to it, especially with the music and the lighting and um, yeah, just the time period too, that it's set in. I think there's a, uh, Goodfellas is kind of a turning point in Scorsese's career where yes. I think what our, our more modern conception of what a Scorsese movie is starts with that movie. And previous to that, uh, I think he's more attached to like New York. There's a lot of the two movies 
uh, in the first couple of decades of the career that we'll be covering is there's a lot of shooting just on the streets of New York City, grimy yeah. 70s and 80s New York. Um, yeah, he also collaborated a lot with this writer named Paul Schrader, who's also become a director. And a lot of the movies I think that he's helping write on, which he is on Taxi Driver, are just... They're always about these like dark, angry men and like how they are dealing with like their repression or anger or, you know, whatever their obstacle or object of rage is. Well, it's funny because he's it seems like he's like a mental health advocate or Mm -hmm. something. But during these times, mental health wasn't really looked at as seriously as it's looked at today. And um Yeah, it's interesting because I think our main character in Taxi Driver is a war veteran. Mm -hmm. So he's dealing with some PTSD and he's got some other stuff going on. He's constantly complaining about these headaches that he has. Um, And so, yeah, from that aspect, it's interesting because you don't really see a lot of films from that time period kind of dealing with that, like that mental health aspect, especially in men. I I think there is a a, an era of post Vietnam, like what happened to the veterans when they come home. But this movie kind of just puts that in the background which i think is more realistic uh you know it's not like uh or the movie i'm thinking of is like you know brothers the like jake gyllenhaal this isn't about <laughs> oh and uh toby mcguire but it's post iraq yeah. war and it's not some like melodrama about how like this guy came home and he's changed and he's totally different and he's and raging are... out at his his daughter <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's not about like how travis bickle de niro's character is unhinged but it's not like he's not sitting there being like the war changed me. Yeah. I'm so broken after the war. Well, it's delusion with this character yeah. where he thinks he's okay for the most part. Or I wouldn't even say he thinks he's okay, but he's like he doesn't really understand what's going on with him. And but he's got this idea in his head that he is supposed to do something in order to 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 change his environment kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, clean up the streets kind of stuff. I think before we dig in any further, we can get into our first segment. The performance test. It was the performance of a lifetime. And between this and the King of Comedy, which we will do next episode, this is Bob De Niro in his inability to understand social cues <laughs> yeah. era. I was gonna say, I was gonna say, between these two movies, this is basically just De Niro being terrible with women. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Robert De Niro, yeah, not being able to handle social cues, playing these socially awkward people, and it's like the two ends of the spectrum between yeah. these two movies here he's very insular and like rageful and also like i am better than you although he's not yeah he looks around the streets driving around his taxi driver he's like i see the scum i want the rain to wash him away yeah and it's like this guy he doesn't do fucking shit he's a taxi driver which like whatever you can have whatever job you want but he also is clearly like I think a lot of what this movie is about and a lot of his performance is how insular and insulated and how antisocial he's kind of created his own life and he can't figure out how to break out of it. Yeah. And I mean, that's something I can identify with a bit. Well, but I, it's, I think part of it, too, is, I mean, if you think about that, uh, the veteran aspect where he's constantly in soldier mode, where he he thinks from uh, on the inside or you know, because his time in, in the war or whatever, that, you know, he is the good guy. And so he's got this white knight personality, and that's like, yeah. So I think the veteran aspect really does play a, a big part of this character. I remember what I was doing. I was trying to recap a little bit, but basically we meet Bob De Niro. He goes in, gets a job. He's like, I want to drive overnight and taxi driver. I'm an insomniac. I don't sleep anyway, so I'm going to, I want to drive overnight. And he works long hours and he doesn't really talk to anyone. He goes home and he writes in his journal. And at some point, I forget whether he picks her up as a fair or just sees her, but there's some woman that works at a campaign office. He's literally parked in front of their office Mm -hmm. and he's just staring at her. So then again, red flags going on with this guy. And like no social, no social cues, just like real creepy vibes. Like through the like glass doors yeah. entry and he's literally just staring daggers into her desk as soon as he's noticed some you know well there's like a comparison between travis bickle and then uh rupert uh pum- pumpkin or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> or whatever um they're both very charming when they want to be mm-hmm. and i think it lures in people almost where it's like i kind of buy this guy at first but then you start to see these underlying factors of like okay something's off about this dude you know i think with the when he, when he introduced himself to the uh 
his object of desire. It's not even that he's charming. It's that he's so bold that it, she's kind of like, maybe there's something up with this guy. Yeah. You know, like it. Yeah. what was really just a total lack of like etiquette and social skills comes across as like, this guy's extremely confident. Yeah. In the moment, until you realize and things kind of unfold with her, that you're until like, until he thinks a great first date is to bring her to a porno, yeah, <laughs> a porno flick. <laughs> it's funny. I was, idea. I was, uh, I watched like a couple like recap videos just because I watched this like a week or two ago, and I wanted to just remind myself what was going on. And um, in this little recap, they're like, oh, understandably, uh, when uh, Betsy gets taken to the porn theater she's put off by it and one of the like incel comments at the bottom was like that's not understandable she's just a snowflake oh jesus so somebody didn't understand this movie <laughs> <laughs> that's the one thing about this movie which we can maybe get into let let the hate flow through you and it's not necessarily i think a problem with the movie but the problem with people this guy might be seen as a hero yeah it's very much the same kind of concept as like the movie drive yeah and the movie the joker which we could probably get into more in the king of comedy but um yeah, there's definitely some comparisons going on. Um, so Bob De Niro, he's driving around, and he's slowly just unraveling. There's a great scene, where, which is a Martin Scorsese cameo, where he picks up a fare who just wants him to park outside a building and wait with him. And he's like, look up there. You see that shadow? That's my wife. <laughs> see the woman in the window? Do you, do you see the woman in the window? Yeah. You see the woman? So I want you to see that one because that's my wife. But that's not my apartment. <laughs> it's not my apartment. You know who lives there? Huh? No, I mean, you wouldn't know who lives there. I'm just saying. But you know who lives there? Huh? A nigga lives there. They're like that. Yeah. She's, that's not my apartment, though. She's with another man. And him just being just pissed off and travis is just like not not really sure how to deal with this whole scenario yeah yeah which it, well that's part of like again like that uh, he he exudes confidence but when it's time to, to actually act then it's like he kind of shuts down a little bit kind of wide and like wide eyes and yeah and after things fall apart with uh the girl uh he runs into a underage prostitute played by a very young jody foster named iris and he actually buys time with her and he's kind of develops a relationship with her where he's like, I, I want to take you out of this life. And during one of their lunch sit down, she's like, uh, I don't want to live with my parents anymore. And she's, you know, I, she has a clearly immature view on the world and what's going on, but also he does as well in his own twisted way. Yeah. Um, and that becomes sort of the driving force of the second half of the movie between the breakup and meeting uh, Jodie Foster's character because sort of our climax is first he... Also, there's a great scene where he goes and buys guns. I love that scene. That is a great scene. In which case, for you, I'd recommend 38 Snub Nose. Look at this. Look at that. That's a beautiful little touch. It's nickel-plated, Snub Nose... Otherwise, it's the same as a service revolver. That'll stop anything that moves. The Magnum, they use that in Africa for killing elephants. That 38, that's a fine gun. For what was it like, Slim Andy, or like this? Is ta <laughs> He's a traveling businessman. Yeah. And then he just walks him upstairs to like a 20th floor. Two briefcases, just absolutely loaded with pistols. He was very professional. I'll give him that. No, oh, yeah. <laughs> I would buy a gun from that guy yeah, for sure. For he starts twisting his anger towards this woman who scorned him, towards the the politician that she's campaigning for, who he tries, makes a very vain attempt to assassinate towards the end of the movie. Yeah. And then after that, it kind of seems like Travis is like, well, I got to shoot somebody today. So he goes down to the pimp that is holding a young Jody Poster and blasts away at everybody involved in that scene. Yeah. Uh, camera pans up and then we get an ending which is uh, spoilers I suppose for Taxi Driver I think can be read a couple different ways um, he's bloodied and actually tries to kill himself at the end of the the, the shootout 
Uh, but then the police arrive, and then we cut to, like, a newspaper on the wall that says, like, taxi driver hero. Yeah. Uh, you know, cleaned up a bunch of pimps and drug dealers. The parents are, like, uh, the parents of Iris are, like, very grateful, and they're sending him letters, and they want him to come visit, and they actually visited him in the hospital when he was on, in a coma. Yeah. Um, it, it It reads very, like like too good Mm -hmm. too good to be true kind of thing and that's when we can start like kind of speculating whether or not this is all subconscious kind of stuff coming out this is like the ending that he wanted Mm -hmm. or if this actually happened i think i read somewhere that that martin scorsese he said that the ending is like it's a true ending but it's also kind of vague on his part because i mean he's never really ended a film that's like vague like that other than maybe like shutter island kind of thing um but yeah you can kind of read it any kind of way you want to i like the perspective that this is all made up i think that works better for his character yeah i think it could be equally played as it's a fantasy or it's reality and we can maybe get into the themes of that a little more later the the writers and martin scorsese and robert de niro have all spoken on what they think the end of the movie is um i just wanted to shout out Something we kind of skimmed past is a couple times Travis goes to uh, meet up with all his cabbie friends. Yeah. And they just have ridiculous conversations that are like, you can tell that like all these guys are on the spectrum of like antisocial weirdos. And then Travis is like even an outsider from yeah, this and gang. That friend group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which is just an interesting context. And like the moment where he, the guy, I think his nickname is the wizard. He like one of the older cab drivers. He's like asking him for advice. And this guy is kind of like, oh, You'll you know, be all right. You have a job. You know, go outside. Go get laid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Give some very, like, generic advice, which also I don't think you can blame him. You're probably not like, oh, this man is filled with the seething rage is going to murder someone at any mm, moment. Yeah. Like, you can't yeah. know that from the, the little interaction they've had. You know, you do a thing, and that's what you want. I mean, like, I've been a, I've been a cabbie for 17 years, you know, 10 years at night. I still don't own my own cab. You know, Why? Because I don't want to. I must be what I what I want. You know, to be on the night shift, driving somebody else's cab. You understand? Uh, I mean, you, you, you become, you get a job, you, you become the job. I mean, like one guy lives in Brooklyn. One guy lives in Sutton Place. You get a lawyer. Another guy's a doctor. Another guy dies. Another guy gets well. And, you know, people are born. I, I envy you, you. Go on, get laid. Get drunk, you know, you do anything. Because you got no choice anyway. I mean, we're all fucked. More or less, you know? But the the cabbie gang is a interesting crew to like. And the whole pace of this movie is like... We have the, the soundtrack that plays a lot. That's a beautiful song. And it's kind of... It's weirdly laid back for how intense the main character is yeah you know yeah it's got this sort of meandering thing going on and it's a pretty short film it's like a little under hour 45 but i I don't know i just think it's interesting that's at odds because you've seen a lot of movies you know guys that need to commit revenge or whatever and they're usually like pounding pulsing type of movies and this movie is kind of just like oh it's late i'm tired you're tired yeah it, it sets a tone so well. We'll get it more into it during It's an Art. Um, but I really want to shout out Robert De Niro. Um, <clears throat> just one of the greatest actors of our time. He, This is him very much uh, showing some range a little bit. Because um, we're so used to him being the typical mob guy or some New Yorker. Yeah. Or, you know, he's always got the frowny face on, that kind of thing. In this, he's, he's very... He's stoic, but at the same time, he just... I mean... He's able to portray this like very uh, socially awkward um, kind of uh, repressed in- individual, and it, it's it's just very interesting to see because you don't see him in too many types of films like this. Um, yeah, so just shout out to Robert De Niro. He's he's awesome. Um, Jodie Foster. I I don't know if this was was her first feature film. I'm pretty sure it had to be one of them. Definitely early on, at least, because she's like she was 16. actually 12 in this, I believe. She's 12. Um, yeah, she was pretty young. Um, she had to play kind of a difficult role, 
of the it's kind of an uncomfortable role where she is a 12 year old prostitute and she's being uh preyed on and pimped out by some fucking weirdo skis ball by harvey keitel and yeah. bobby o'hare <laughs> yeah yeah um and just some very uncomfortable scenes with her but then you know it it's very much this film is very much grounded in reality where it's like you you believe these characters exist you know and uh yeah it, it, especially with the setting and everything it just it fits so well into this kind of universe that they've created and um yeah Jodie Foster is great shout out to her um yeah you like you said you have Harvey Keitel who plays sport he plays the uh the the pimp um for the couple scenes that he's in He's pretty great. He he just looks like he's coked out all the time. He's hovering in a doorway. <laughs> yeah, and he's just moving, kind of dancing the whole time. And you're like, what is up with this guy? He's just coked out of his he mind. He's kind of like a like a Grand Theft Auto NPC because he's <laughs> yeah. always in that doorway. Yeah, you like, just you would get a mission from him or something. You'd think he would have a chair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Get comfortable, man. No, he he's fine right where he's at. Um, we uh, le- have Leonard Harris as Senator Charles Palantine. He has a couple scenes where he's. Uh, um, doing some speeches and God, Charles Palantine, Senator Palpatine. Oh my God! <laughs> Star Wars. Star Wars. No, don't start this. Please. <laughs> Is it too early to bring up Star Wars? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Just a thought I had. It's one letter apart. He. What if uh, Travis went went to um, the the senator and the senator was like, wipe them out, <laughs> all of them. And he was talking about all the pimps. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> or like uh, the the campaign lady, she gets disillusioned, and they're all applauding at that rally, and she's like, "This is how democracy dies." <laughs> With two thunderous applause. applause. <laughs> <laughs> the first galactic empire. <laughs> New York City will be reorganized. <laughs> I do love. I think that uh, that guy he gets in. He gets a ride from Travis, from Travis and. Uh, like midway through the film and he's doing the like classic politician glenn and he's like hey buddy what do you think about the city and he he, he see like travis kind of like rock and be like somebody needs to clean this motherfucker up like there's all the scum on the streets and this guy's in the back like yeah <laughs> like okay. yeah that's that's what i'm doing <laughs> like just get the vote for any reason i actually find that to be the most eerie scene because i mean he, he's inevitably in the in, in the cab where a guy is going to try to murder that guy is going to try to murder him later on it's just like weird like how he, that could have been avoided if he just never got in that cab you know just uh yeah i found that scene to be kind of eerie and it just kind of showed that dark side of travis that we hadn't really seen up until that point so. yeah there's a point yeah soon after that where he's kind of snaps he starts working out buying guns and he's like you know, planning his whole thing. <laughs> I was kind of laughing at the scene where he's like, I got to train my body. To... It, it just reminded me of like Batman or something, yeah. but he was like holding his wrist over like a, the, the burner on the stove. And he was like, I got to train my fucking body. And like his veins were popping out. And it was just hilarious. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, this is also the movie with the famous, you talking to me? You talking to me? Yep. That, that is an iconic scene. Are you talking to me? You talking to me? You talking to me? You talking to me? Well, then who the hell else are you talking to? You talking to me? Well, I'm the only one here. Who the fuck do you think you're talking to? Oh, yeah? Huh? Okay. I do love uh, when he says, hey, you got a gun? And he's like, what are you talking about? Get the fuck out of here. And he flicks a cigarette at him. Bow. Right yeah. one. <laughs> yeah. Right to the kidney. <laughs> well, that, I was going to say another thing. Well, you know what? Let's move on to uh, It's an Art. We could talk a little bit about it. It's an Art is where we talk about stuff. the aspects of the filmmaking process. That's effects, lighting, music. What's this? It's an art project. Okay, I like it. Picasso. Yeah, that way. I was going to say, so the, the movie is not violent up until it gets violent. Um, you really don't see anything too crazy up until the ending. And it's kind of shocking how gory this movie is or how realistic the violence is. Um, it, the 
like you were saying, that scene where a sport gets shot in the gut. I, I felt that. That was like, holy shit, that looked like a fucking snuff film. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you imagine was... a headshot, but no, it's like straight to the kidney and goes down, just going like, oi, 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 oi. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then when he blasts, so he the, he goes into the apartment, uh, he he shoots the guy's fingers off, right? And so he goes up, gets Iris, and then he like pops a dude in the, like, through the the neck into the skull or whatever and it, it was like his brain splattered on the wall that was fucking intense i was like jesus like that packed a punch um but yeah it was all practical it was great um big squibs travis gets lit up i think he takes one like through the neck at some point yeah uh and then he kind of makes his way up to iris's room to which iris is just obviously freaking out at the just massive pandemonium and violence happening around her yeah she's not like oh thank god for rescuing me he tries to kill himself doesn't have a bullet and then he does the other famous tax driver image which is the finger pistols to the head the bloody fingers yeah that's a great shot mm-hmm. really great shot um that really sticks with you because it kind of like it shows that manic side to him where it's just like yeah there's this guy is he's far gone man um, you almost feel bad for this character. Almost. Almost. But I think this film does a better job than like Drive or something to kind of make you see like this guy is there's something really off about this dude and stuff. Um, uh, so the music is done by Bernard Herrmann. Uh, he is best known for working on Citizen Kane. Um, Just a little indie project. You might not have heard of it. <laughs> you might not have heard of it, you know. Um, <laughs> It's no Star Wars, that's for sure. <laughs> that's for damn sure. <laughs> um, Rosebud, my ass. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's just a fantastic score. Um, I actually went and downloaded this on Apple Music after I watched it. It's it's great. I feel like it would be a good kind of like jazz tune to put on when you're driving. Yeah, uh, you could nice drive around, but then you might want to shoot someone, I guess. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. It is um, very like slow, a lot of saxophone. Yeah. Something you could slow dance to. And uh, it's it's predominantly played during scenes where Travis is just kind of stalking around at night, just kind of driving his cab. Um, and they do this really great effect where they kind of show Travis's face. Um, it's like basically you looking through uh, the windshield of his car, and you still see the reflections from the lights as he's driving past. And you can see the neon signs, and it just has this great New York feel to it. And... Uh, yeah, I just really love it. It has, you know, it's because this movie's set in the 70s. I mean, I think it's supposed to be. It's po- like post-Vietnam, maybe? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, it's just got a great vibe. I just love the, uh, I could just watch a whole, like, compilation of just those scenes and just kind of have it on the background with some music, you know? Yeah, and it's very, like, because he is a taxi driver, he's kind of just, he's a passive observer, content like getting seethingly angry like more and more as things go on but at the same time we're like looking at the neon signs and this the beautiful swing music playing and it's kind of like uh it's a little at odds with what's happening with this character but i like that i like that it's not like pouting music like yeah like this man's boiling over with rage well this movie could have went one of two ways it could have went well this way and then it could have went the canon films way, where it's like, this guy is like the equalizer. You know yeah. what I mean? Where he's just going around and popping people left and right. Um, and I'm glad they didn't do that. I'm glad it's a lot more methodical and it's a lot more thought-provoking. This is not Death Wish. No, not <laughs> at all. <laughs> um, but I, the music kind of harkens back to kind of some noir kind of stuff. And um, yeah, for whatever reason, it just works. It just fits very well. I couldn't see this movie with any other kind of soundtrack. Yeah. And Martin Scorsese, whether he's uh, just choosing songs that are already released or getting a score, it's always something interesting. Yeah. That's just always a, some really great music. And I'm assuming a lot of what they're capturing is just business on the New York streets. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's really like a time capsule. I, I noticed... Uh, 
sometimes you can see like onlookers kind of watching as mm -hmm. they film. I noticed that more in King of Comedy, but oh, yeah. there was a lot of that in this too. Um, yeah, that's how you can tell. This is kind of an earlier Martin Scorsese flick. He doesn't have every single like uh, extra like on his payroll. You know yeah. what I mean? The whole block isn't locked down. Yeah. So he yeah. can shoot this movie. Uh, Just kind of walking through Times Square or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, the other thing that we didn't mention as far as like iconic taxi driver things towards the end, he does the Mohawk, which is pretty, I think ahead of its time, as far as like a look, like it became like a punk rock look as we go into the eighties, but like fucking proud boys <laughs> yeah, looking really crazy. But that's also the image of him in his green jacket with his, uh, aviators. Like that is also a pretty iconic yeah, uh, it's military patch and stuff. Yeah. Uh, image from this movie. So we can move on. Let's move on to hey, what are you trying to say? Wait, whatever. You're ready. All right, let me just get that last measurement on your. Thank you. Side you know, there. I, I'm, I need this for the uh, the wedding. Okay, well I, I should. I need it really quickly. Like uh, it could week. take about a week to do. It could take a week. Mm -hmm. So what are you trying to say? He's trying to say that I am so big, my bum is so big, you need to order to various countries far away to get enough material to make a pair of pants so I can fit my incredibly obese buttocks into a pair of your specially made little suit. No, I mean I'm the only one working here this week. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is where we explore the themes and messages of the movie. And here's where I want to say, okay, so... We were talking about whether the ending is reality or a fantasy. Um, so Paul Schrader, the writer of this movie, said it was reality. He also said that he intended this movie to start to be more of a racially motivated thing. He, we forget, we skipped over the scene where his first sort of uh, violent outburst is to the guy that is holding up the convenience store, who is a black man. Yeah. Um, and there's some things like he has that line about... Yeah, he was like, uh, uh, most of the other cabbies, they won't pick up spooks, but I'll pick them up. I don't care. What else was that? And so it was originally a more racial thing, and then all the pimps and all the people at the end were all going to be black men. Which, if you read this as reality, as the writer intended, I think is more a comment on society than it is a comment on Travis Bickle's character. It's meaning some angry white man can shoot up a bunch of black criminals and the the and be praised yeah, for it. Yeah, he will be lauded. They will throw flowers at his feet. People will love him for it. Yeah. Which is not exactly how this movie spins it because they decided that the the racial angle might be too intense uh for what they were intending. So they they kind of did a half measure, but like if you want to read it as reality, I think it makes more sense if they did it that way. Absolutely. Where it's like and it's saying something specific then, where it's like this guy can this racist, which you get the sense over time. It's pretty yeah. subtle, but like you're like this racist can go murder a bunch of black people, and they'll just be like, congratulations, well, if you, if front you, page. If you look at his face when he's driving down the street, and there's a group of black people, it's just searing rage. Yeah, in his in his face, and there's just so much hate in his eyes, you know. So I do agree with you. I, I kind of wish they went that angle too, but then again, we got to think about the time period. I think Watts riots, uh, just the 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 social unrest during that time period it probably wouldn't have helped but to add more fuel to the fire probably <laughs> <laughs> yeah and the other thing and if you read it as a uh as a fantasy i think it's very like you can picture the camera kind of floating over the room as he's sitting there bloody and then it's like this is his dying his, fantasy his it's, soul leaving his body yeah and thing. him just being like oh they will love me for what i've done yeah you know yeah and everything will be fine well, it's very in line with his character, so yeah, that's how I saw the the movie ending. But and he's very delusional in that way. I think think that's well, especially with Betty getting in his car, because I I feel like there should be no reason like she she does that unless it was like pure coincidence. But she's like happy to see him. It's just kind of odd. It didn't seem really in her character. And it's very uh, incel for him to be like, "No, baby, I don't want your money. I'm gonna." You, you turn me down, I'm turning you down. Yeah. It's not good for me. Yeah. You know? It's interesting. Uh, and and I, the one thing I like... The movie 
kind of gets in the mindset of being alone. And I uh, kind of identified with Travis Bickle. Um, I was thinking back to when I moved to Mankato for a couple of years and I didn't really know anyone, especially like those first few weeks I was there. Yeah. And it was like, I wasn't like seething with rage about it, but there is that like, you know, if you're in, in like New York City, it's the most happening place to ever happen. I mean, this was like college town could get yeah. bustling, but it's not New York City. But it's like when you are alone and you don't know how to break out of that and you're like surrounded by people that are clearly have more going on. Yeah. You know, I think it really gotten that like nails that like mindset you can fall into. Where you, again, like you were saying, you become a passive observer Mm -hmm. and you're just kind of watching and you're kind of envying almost. Yeah. Yeah. And there's that, yeah. And there's that removing, like, if when you really don't know anyone, it is hard to, like, break out of that cycle. Like, he he tries to extend an olive branch to to his one cabbie coworker a little too late. He was probably too far down the rope before he tried. But, like... You know, he was not able to connect with uh, the potential romance interest or friends. And it's just like, and then he just spirals down into this. How will people notice me? How will people see me this way? Yeah. yeah. Through violence. That'll gain me my infamy or whatever, you know? Yeah. I think, too, uh, another big aspect we kind of mentioned earlier was like just the mental health aspect where it, it all of this could have been avoided if somebody just actually genuinely tried to help him. Um, if the cabbie maybe spent a little bit more time listening, listening instead of just spewing kind of cliche nonsense to him, um, and actually like sought out help for him, I think this could have been avoided. And, uh, that just speaks to mental health in general. Uh, obviously we're in a much better place now societal wise, uh, as far as how we deal with mental health, but mental health, but, um, yeah, especially with veterans, it's just, uh, it's a tough thing because PTSD is, uh, um, at least back then it was, it wasn't really understood. And so he, Travis is going through the stuff. He has headaches. He has, doesn't understand why he can't sleep, that kind of stuff. And, uh, yeah, it's just a little too late. I think. Should we move on to our next section where we let the hate flow through you? Good. Use your aggressive feelings, boy. Let the hate flow through you. So we mentioned some of the racial stuff was a little uncomfortable. Um, obviously, the stuff with Jodie Foster was probably the most hard to watch for me. It was just very creepy and weird. Um, she was actually young in this. And that's what kind of made me feel like kind of gross. Yeah. Um, especially the scenes with the uh, – there's like a scene where she's in the apartment with um, Sport, which is her pimp, and uh, he's kind of like – in full predator mode where he's telling her like whispering all these sweet nothings to her. And, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, he's got this long Coke fingernail. It just made me feel gross. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean all that, I mean, you're supposed to feel gross, but it's also like, there's a bunch of grown men watching this all go down in reality yeah. and yeah. demanding this out of her. Yeah. You know? So it's just a weird it, this kind of just, it just reminded me a little bit of uh, what's that movie with uh, Natalie Portman? Oh, Leon the Professional. Yeah, it wasn't as bad as that, but it was yeah. like kind of like yeah, this girl like she's just too young for this. So I, I think they should have casted a, you know, an ca- older actress, cast a nineteen-year-old or whatever. Yeah, someone yeah. that looks young but is actually of age. Yeah. Um, oh. And then I'm afraid this movie taught a real bad lesson accidentally, or a lot of people are going to walk away from this movie with the wrong impression. For and sure. I like it. This is not like, I don't know. You don't see Taxi Driver on the wall like you see Scarface. Or The Punisher. Or The Punisher. But, uh, I mean, much like the Joker movie, um, which is ripping this off a bit. It, it, it's just, uh, you know, it's about an angry man who didn't get help and then got praised for his violence. So Yeah. An agent of chaos. So, I just... Uh, it's not so much a problem with the movie, but I think a lot of people will walk away with the wrong impression because it doesn't hand the like answer key to you on a silver platter. Like yeah. this is a bad guy. You don't want to be like Travis Bickle because he's an awful person. Yeah. Some people obviously need that spelled out for them. Yeah. Um, but I think that's also the beauty of film. It's, it can be, uh, 
uh, interpreted many different ways. And sometimes it, it's interpreted the wrong way. And then you have people, copycats or people who are trying to uh, kind of manifest that, that, that kind of image onto themselves. Yeah, it's kind of a tricky situation because you couldn't really do this kind of thing now. I mean, obviously, they did the Joker a few years ago, but even that drive. was kind of like, I think that was the most controversial aspect when it came to reviews where people were like, why are we like, why do we have a film about like praising a, a madman when we have like real people who go into churches and murder a bunch of people? Yeah. You know, it's just like different things like that. It's thought provoking in that aspect. And I guess it's interesting. And in, at least in the case of this, because this really predates a lot of our like mass violence. Yeah. You know. Like Columbine is what, like ninety three or ninety one, you know? Like I'm sure there was other like uh one person that was a uh influence on the writing process of this movie is I'm forgetting the woman's name, but it's the woman that tried to kill Gerald Ford. Oh wow. So, so the police uh, so like there were definitely numerous attempts to assassinate like Reagan. Yeah. Uh later after this movie. Um so it's just interesting. Yeah, the seventies sick or like 60s, 70s were full with of political unrest, and then there was also like you know what else was really big in the 70s? Fucking serial killers. Yeah. That was then. Um, um, yeah. So I guess you could back then, and then also they had like the satanic panic thing. So everybody was kind of like back then, like oh, films will influence people, you yeah. know? And uh, I mean, obviously, I think influence a few people who couldn't uh, distinguish fiction from reality, but um, I think you kind of still get that today, even. Yeah, and I think it just previous to this, uh, like this guy firmly falls in the anti-hero camp, and I don't know enough about like the, that early like 50, 50, 60, 70s, the stuff leading up to that. To like, when did the anti-heroes really become a thing? But like, if you think of like, uh, shit, what is it called? The Clint Eastwood movies where he goes, "Are you feeling lucky, oh, punk?" Uh, Dirty Harry, where like, he just murders a bunch of minorities. Where he just time. murders everyone. I'm pretty sure Dirty Harry's supposed to be read as. As the hero. As yeah. the hero. And there's a lot of like vigilante murder hero. Well, even hero. Rambo. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So it's it's an interesting like counterbalance to that if you read it that way. Should we ask our final question? Let's do it. Is this a perfect movie? He lost a baby brother. Perfect in every way. I had a baby brother! I had a little baby brother! And it was perfect! Perfect in every way! Ooh, this is, uh, this might be a tough one. This is definitely in the, like, if you're looking at, like, the AFI Top 100, I'm pretty sure this is high up on their oh, yeah. all-time movies list. But we are not the AFI. We're not the American Film Institute. We're just a couple of guys. We are the PMP. Yeah. The pimps. <laughs> We're much like a uh, uh, sport. <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. Much like Drake, Aubrey Graham. No, no not, not at, at all. all. <laughs> um, I don't know. I I like this movie. I think it was very influential. There's definitely iconic stuff littered in it. As far as how I felt about it, I'm like, this is interesting, but this is not approaching like my favorite thing or a thing that I need to you know, shout from the rooftops, go watch Taxi Driver. You know, I've, I've seen this a few times. I, I don't really feel inclined to ever watch it again. Yeah. Um, it is a certified bad time, so there's also yeah, that. Yeah, I, but like you said, there's some great imagery. Um, there's some just very iconic moments uh, that have kind of solidified themselves into the film Hall of Fame. Um, yeah, this one... I just think as far as Martin Scorsese's works, it definitely lays the groundwork for his future films and just his filming style in general. But uh, he just has so much, so many better films, you know? Yeah. So. And I don't want to hold that against him. No. Though. You have to I'm, start somewhere. I'm considering uh, making June the Joel and Ethan Cohen. June. Oh, yeah. So, you know, the, if we're doing our two favorites back to back. You know, there's going to be a lot of movies that we maybe consider. I still wouldn't consider this one. How about this? This one's in the history books, but it's not on our list. Yeah, we can make that like a category. This is like a this is a film school must. Like oh, a, for sure. I think I watched this in a, in film class. Yeah. You know, like this is a this is definitely a core text that I, I should have got to it earlier, but it is not not going to be on the list. Yeah, 
I think uh, the artistic flavor is what does it for me the most. I think the just the soundtrack and the uh, the scenes at night, um, just great. And you have a lot of moments where you just kind of like looking at Travis, and it seems like you're kind of trying to read his mind a little bit. What's he thinking? What's he going to do? Um, you have that underlying like uh, thought that he's going to snap eventually, and I just yeah. really love that. Um, so yeah, not a perfect movie, but it definitely is in the Hall of Fame. I think for me, and this is one of Scorsese's strengths throughout but you can feel him start to hone it is something you mentioned earlier was the just the conversational way of his dialogue yeah and like we're we're working our way up to crescendo to like goodfellas where it's like like three guys saying lines and they all like kind of half cover each other yeah um and this is yeah it just got that like meandering conversational style where you like it doesn't feel like lines you never know when somebody's gonna stop talking yeah. You know, yeah. like they sometimes it's just especially with Travis Bickle and his whole inner monologue. It's just like, you know, kind of just diarrhea of every thought. Yeah. That's occurring, it yeah. seems like. And it's it feels real. And then you shoot, throw it in the middle of real New York and it just has a very, you know. Real is a dumb word, but you know what I mean? Like it's there are movies that are it's grounded. Yeah. yeah. That are more fantastical and this one's just like street level yeah you're in the yeah. you're in the back of the cab you're martin scorsese in the back of the cab looking up at your wife with <laughs> another man yeah <laughs> i mean it, it has that gorilla style film aspect of kind yeah. of like you know like halloween or you know it just it's, you're following this character and it's great so yeah uh if you have not watched uh taxi driver i think we both highly recommend mm-hmm. at least you check it out it's definitely for film buffs it's like that's one of the ones you got to watch um at least once so yeah so next week we'll continue marty may uh with another martin scorsese movie from the 80s yes see you then bye can you imagine that i'm gonna end the podcast just in a reasonable amount of time don't say anything <laughs> just, just end it <laughs> Listen, you fuckers, you screwheads. Here is a man who would not take it anymore. Who would not let... Listen, you fuckers, you screwheads. Here is a man who would not take it anymore. A man who stood up against the scum, the cunts, the dogs, the filth, the shit. Here is someone who stood up. <laughs>